Time is We're on the clock. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome. <sighs> this is so nice and intimate, isn't it? <coughs> Thank you, everyone, for attending. Right, over the next hour or so, you'll be hearing from three of us. We just said some of this, but I've written it down already. I was a bit prepared. You're going to be hearing from three of us about leadership and leading like Jesus. Now, until Ruth spoke a moment ago, I believe my portion Joy. of this... Joy, she's reading my notes. Oh, we're not supposed to read them. No, these are my notes in my third session. This is that page. Do you want to make any notes? Because I'm going to go with a hand up. It was important. I'm, I'm just going to talk about different styles of leadership. <laughs> 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 and the bossy ones. <laughs> no, and that is actually what we're going to say next. This, this presentation, the first part of it is for me, for about 15 minutes, hopefully. And I'm just going to talk about different styles of, of leadership. Now, because of my first background career as a, as a soldier, I've attended many courses over uh, many years trying to teach me how to become a good leader in the army's ways. So Ruth kindly bought me a book from when I got back from last week, and I went, read that and write stuff and present it this Sunday. So I've, I've done that. Um, so I've attended all these presentations, study days and courses, some of them have been weeks or months long, and they all tell you all about how to be a leader, how to do this and how to do that. But that was all very sort of military specific, and a lot of it can be transferred across to all aspects of your life, to a civilian career or also into church, and some of it's very good. So I've read all these words, um, <clears throat> and I've experienced examples of both really, really good leadership in the army, and I've experienced some really, really terrible examples of leadership in the army. And then, unfortunately for me, that same pattern continued into my civilian career. I hope nobody at work watches this because they're getting it a bit like that. <laughs> um, I can't, I'm not qualified to cover everything about leadership in a, in a 15 minutes um, that we've got to talk about it. People have studied leadership for, for centuries and centuries. People much more educated than me have written volumes and volumes of text upon this. You can go do courses online, you can do courses at college, you can do courses in university that teach you about leadership and give you the umpteen qualifications. But one of the main things about leadership is you have to practice it in order to become proficient at it. One of my first obstacles when I was preparing this was so <coughs> I have no idea who would be in the audience today. Last week we had a little meeting about this and what we were going to do and what we were going to say. And we said, well, put everybody in a circle. And I was like that. It might not be me, Bob and Ruth there. It might be a triangle, <laughs> you know, to be honest. But, you know, so I'm quite pleased today that we've got all different people here, all different ages, all different situations. So what I hope to sort of achieve is just to make you aware of different styles of leadership that people employ and how they employ them. Sometimes knowingly they employ them, sometimes they don't. And sometimes it's just more of a natural thing. And people are, there are some natural born leaders out there. It's just to introduce some of those ideas to you formally. And then when I move on and I, and I escape, I'm going to hand you over to Bob. And hopefully what Bob will bring into this equation is a deeper understanding and a better appreciation of the way that Jesus um, led his apostles, disciples, and all the people around him, and create, you know, and, and took us further on with Christianity. And now, there's two edges to this presentation for me. I'd love to encourage you all to become leaders, whether it's in a, a formal role within the church, or it's a, an informal role that can be practiced outside of church or amongst people. Um, this isn't it, Bob. Bob, read this thing. And the ultimate aim of all these presentations is of getting as many people into heaven in the best condition possible, which I have also stolen from what Bob said the other week. <laughs> some things that you say, just as something that you might say at some stage in the future, might just impress itself upon somebody else. And they will remember that, hopefully, uh, for, a, for a long time. I'm sure we will have people say to us different things at different times. Think, you know what, that's stuck a, a chord in me. I don't remember that. Viv, for instance, Viv for his, one of his favourite passages is in Judges. It's right at the end of Judges. Um, I thought, we'll talk about leadership. Why do we need leaders? 
And at the end of Judges, in chapter 21, verse 25, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And then, uh, me and Viv and Jackie would meet up quite often and we chat about stuff. And Viv's battered this verse into me, so I've nearly memorised it now. <laughs> um, <coughs> which is very true. If everybody did what they thought was right in their own eyes and there was no recognition of sin and no recognition of consequences or being accountable for what you've done, mm. you just do what you wanted when you wanted. So that's why we need leaders. The leaders are there to guide us and direct us, to encourage us, to... Is Jackie here? But no. To admonish us. Jackie's really good at admonishing <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell her this bit. <laughs> so in preparing this, um, I've been thinking about it for a, for a fair few weeks, and I started jotting a few notes down on my phone, and I was like, right, okay, I'll do this, and I'll do that, and I'll do that. And then at about seven o'clock last night, I realized that I haven't actually got five and a half weeks to teach this, I've got 15 minutes. <laughs> so I've actually been in a, a rare situation where I've come to present something to church, and I'm having to whittle stuff out as opposed to flesh it out a little bit more. So I started off where everybody starts when they go and do something in the presentation. I started with Google. And um, I just Googled, what is leadership? And it says, the state or position of being a leader. So I was like, really <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Google and the Oxford definition of what is being a leader. So then I Google, not leadership, I Google leader. And that is a person who leads a group of people, especially the head of a country or an organisation. Is that right? Okay, yes, that's a bit better. And I Google lead, and it came up with PB, an element in the metallic table. <laughs> no, 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 that's right. Lead is to go with or in front of a person or an animal to show the way or to make them go in the right direction. <coughs> so all these diff dictionary definitions are all there, and they are all quite correct, but then you have to step away from, from the dictionary and have to look at what other people's meanings and interpretations of leaders are. So I don't consider myself a schooled man, more of a, an unschooled man, not so weird. <coughs> so I, I looked into it, and a lot of these definitions on Google and all this, they're all aimed at corporations, they're all aimed at business or an industry, or a process, and while they're all vaguely similar, there's differences. So I'm going to go through some of the common um, definitions of leadership styles later on in this. What I do want to say is all of us do lead at some point in our lives. It doesn't matter if you've never had a, a formal, I don't know all of your backgrounds here, I don't know for instance, what you've done in the past, what you do in the future. I've shared a little bit about my I was in the army, did a few things right occasionally and got promoted on merit, even less occasionally, but I did get there. Um, but some of you may have already done courses in manage management and leadership and in supervision and things like that. I'm looking around, I'm seeing uh, doctors, nurses, uh, teachers, um, policemen. What? Oh, look at me. <laughs> Engineers, and, and that's just the people who I know. Social workers, I don't know everybody's role in their previous life. I've seen counsellors as well now. I don't know all of your backgrounds all the way through. But I suspect that some of you will have been subjected to some leadership training at some stage in the past. And it's sort of like a bit a bit uh, daunting that you're going to speak to someone who's like that. And someone sat there, you know, at the back, at the back of the room going, I've just done a course on this, this bloke is waffling. Yeah, I can read upside down as well. That's what <laughs> one of the minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no. So I don't know where you are all at with that. So my aim is to cover all the bases and just start from, from scratch. But we have all I think everyone in here will have led at some stage, either willingly or sorry, knowingly or unknowingly. Because everything that you do and say can have an effect on somebody else. Uh, and I nearly went down a right rabbit hole talking about all the uh, qualities of a leader. But if you don't do what you say you do, then you're not really a good leader, are you? Mm -hmm. If you can't act out what you're telling anybody else to do. Mm -hmm. Far away from the, the definition of uh, do as I say, not as I do. It just doesn't work. You have to, to do that. 
So some people have been leading now, have been managers, they're supervisors. Some will have leadership roles within the church. Some of you might be leading as parents. Because they're kids, they're little kids, they're, they're their first role models, the first people who tell them what to do, how to behave, what morals are, what values are, what standards are with parents. So I think pretty much everybody in this room that I'm looking at, got relationships with people, nephews, nieces, kids, along their life. So you're all role models for somebody. Now when we look into the Bible, the Bible calls us all to be good role models. I'm looking at um, Titus 2 verse 7. And you yourself must be an example to them by doing good works of every kind. Let everything you do reflect the integrity and seriousness of your teaching. So it's really important you are a good role model. One of my favourite verses, which I think Ruth can probably uh, quote by heart now, is from 2 Corinthians 3, and it's verse 3. And I really bring this into a role model thing. In there it says, Clearly you are a letter from Christ showing the results of our ministry among you. This letter is written not with pen and ink, but with the spirit of the living God. It is carved not on tablets of stone, but on human hearts. So hopefully we're all here, you're all at church, you're all here voluntarily, you've come to church, you, you could have sneaked off during the lunch break, but you've stayed here. So hopefully you all show some desire to be, if not a leader, as we said earlier on, not everyone's role is to be a leader, or to be a foundation stone, or some sort of lines. You can be a better role model for people, you can be that good example for people, you can share a word that you've had, a word that was in season for you that you can share with somebody else and encourage them and, motivi and, and motivate them. I'm a bit spoiled for choice of information here, but again, if you're wrong, you can't go far wrong looking at this one. Okay? 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 4. 1 Timothy 3, verse 1 to 4. This is a trust, trustworthy saying. If someone aspires to be a church leader, he desires an honourable position. So a church leader must be a man or woman whose life is above reproach. He must be faithful to his wife. He must exercise self-control, live wisely, and have a good reputation. He must enjoy having guests in his home, and he must be able to teach. He must not be a heavy drinker or be violent. He must be gentle, not quarrelsome, and not love money. He must manage his own family well, having children who respect and obey him. Okay, I've got a pause here now, so if you don't fit all in, you can go and play in the garden if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so and that, that's the standards that the Bible sets for us for, for leaders. Now to be an effective leader, Effective leadership includes exhibiting a strong character. Leaders exhibit honesty, they have integrity, they have trustworthiness, and they have ethics. And those leaders, those same leaders with qualities, will also act in line with how they speak. And think of that song now, let my deeds outweigh my words. Let us do that. <coughs> so the main crutch of what I was asked to speak about, now I've waffled on for 10 minutes, was about the main styles of leadership. And I went to different places to get different quotes on leadership. Uh, this book, Ruth Clark, was really good, really interesting for me. And it lists in there several styles of leadership. And the first one was a directive style. And this is a, the most effective when a leader requires a rapid, unquestioning action. All right? So the first thing, the first thing people think of when they think of the army, and it's true in some respects, especially where there's like safety involved or something's got to be done coin a phrase military precision. I mean you, you can't have like troop in the colour and you say left turn and say, oh well actually no, I'm gonna go right and, and I'll do a left turn but I'm gonna do it in a minute. You know, if you've got something safety orientated on if someone says stop they're just gonna shout stop and it's gonna be given as an order and it's gonna be told and you just like you've got to do it. You've got to do it rapidly. Otherwise things go wrong. Especially where safety concerns. Now that that directive style of leading is very good for things like army drill movements and on the army on the ranges and in war. It's not quite so good for organising the coffee morning. Mm -hmm. no, it's, it's not. It doesn't lend itself. Have you been here with the I was just going to say, have you been here with Jill, can you write that down and underline it? <laughs> <laughs> I really like to say thank you to write the end. 
The next style that he talks about is the participative style. Participative. Put somebody else's team in time. The participative style. The leader asks for and he values the inputs from the team around him. And you are the team around the leaders. So we, we can ask you for your uh, what you would like to see. Is there any input that you'd like to have into things? Ruth put out a questionnaire last year about what, what can we do to improve attendance at a fellowship night? Should we change the night? Should we do it at a different time? Should we do it earlier? Should we do it later? And we got some response back. And, and the aim of this is to build the church. And when I say build the church, I'm not about the extension, I'm not about building the people in the church to increase their knowledge, to increase their wisdom, to increase their ability to do that great commission, to spread the word. An example of that was Moses. When, when Moses, things were getting a bit much from him, he delegated his authority. And he delegated that authority to people around him and underneath him. And he got their participation and their collaboration from his people and went on like that. <coughs> Just been right eye over the informant for two minutes. <laughs> Good with that. <laughs> I'm going to talk about that style in a minute. That's the pace setting style. <laughs> the leader provides challenges, demands high standards, and leads by example. Okay, so you have that. And I, I, I was thinking about that, and it's, that's like in today's fast paced environment of things where things go on. People want results now, and they want they want something. They want it now. They don't want to have to wait until the shops open on Sunday or Sunday. They get it on Amazon. They get it delivered to the house. They pay a bit more. And they have it done now. So we have these pace setters, and it's not always the best way of leading things. But sometimes things need to be done fast. And the, the thing that I brought to mind to me was uh, Nehemiah rebuilding the walls in Jerusalem. Was like, right, you know, these walls need to be building. We need to get them done now. We have these mockers. We have these decriers. They had people actively getting in the way of what he was doing. But they and I rebuilt their walls in 52 days. I mean, that wouldn't even happen now. We can't fix it. Fuck all. <laughs> yeah. I was looking for nickel then. I looked over there. Yeah. You, know, you can't fix the potholes. Well, that's the pace setting style. The penultimate style was the coaching style. This is where the leader encourages dialogue and focuses on the future and encourages the people around him to, to do what he's doing. And then that's, that's brilliant. So Jesus started teaching his disciples how we do ministry. So this is how we do ministry. This is how we pray. This is how we do this. And this is how we do not do it. And he does say that in the Bible. He was getting the best out of his team. He was developing that team. He was focusing very much on the future and preparing for the time when he had to pass the baton on. Because he knew that was coming. And he had to get his team prepared. So he had all these uh, unschooled men that he was teaching. He was like, okay, you need to get you up to this standard, do this, do that, do that, sell the praise, sell the do this, the sell the do that. And several times in the Bible, Jesus sort of admonishes his disciples a little bit. Like, no, we don't do it like that, we do it this way. No, don't stop the children coming. They're not, you know, don't do that. So, and that's another style of leadership. After the Last Supper in, in Matthew 20, verses 25 to 27, Jesus called the disciples together and said, You know that the rulers in this world lord over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. So this is um, servant leadership. And I turned to this book then, and I didn't honestly expect to see servant leadership in a book about why British Army leadership works. So <coughs> bear with me a second. And it, and it warns about things, and it tells you about things. It says here, effective leadership does not arise from the pursuit of rank, status, and the perception of power. Those who aspire simply to attain leadership positions because of the need to assuage an unusual power drive or to acquire material possessions will never command their people's trust, respect and commitment in any meaningful way. So if you want to be a leader because you think it's great and you're going to be all powerful and you'll say, Jill, make me a coffee. It doesn't quite work like that. you know, And that's not, you probably 
doing things for the wrong reason, you probably need to take a look at yourself. So I didn't expect to see an example of servant leadership in this book. And then this is a... Uh, as the most reverend Justin Welby, Archbishop of Canterbury, who had a successful business career before his ordination has described it. Servant leadership does not mean servile leadership. It means you're a catalyst. You're a permission giver. The way you see skills, you back them. You're not afraid to have people around you who are cleverer than you. And you don't feel the need for people to treat you with deference. That's a, that was a great find that this morning. With a lot of respect for Mr. Mr. Welby. I'm going over time now. And I apologise. We have to spend five more minutes now. And that diverse a little bit away from the uh, subjects of leadership here now. And I didn't expect to see this in this book, but I, I draw a striking comparison here. Field Marshal Erwin Rommel's barb that the British write some of the best doctrine in the world. It is fortunate their officers do not read it. Is what <laughs> <laughs> There's another phrase, lions led by donkeys as well, which another German general said. The, the Germans had quite a lot to say about the British during the war and after the war, but I found that quite striking. And I drew a comparison about that to the Israelites in the uh, Old Testament. They, they didn't listen to the Bible, they didn't do what the Bible said. And I think we can carry that forward to us into present day as well. If we're not reading the Bible and we're not following the instructions and the guidance that's in the Bible, we're probably not ready to be leading other people. a leader, you become a bit more accountable. Right. So from Hebrews 4, right, for the word of God is alive and powerful and sharp and sharpest, two-edged sword, put between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow, exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. And he is the God <coughs> to whom we are all accountable. God knows what you're thinking, what you're doing, and what you're saying. And you are accountable to God. Now, as I draw to a, a close in a couple of minutes, I want you to encourage you to read further and to look into these stars of leadership. And after I've jotted all your names down, after I've got most of your numbers somewhere in my phone, I will get those out in a bit. I'm going to send out a questionnaire that Ruth showed me the other day in another leadership book. And it tells you what sort of leader you are. You fill it in honestly, and then after you've sent out the questionnaire by WhatsApp, or if you need to text me and say, I've done that, I'll send you the answers. And then you, go, you mark yourself. And it's just for you to know. And it might let you know what sort of leader you are at the moment and what areas you may need to develop, if you want to develop, and then what you're going to put yourself How to improve yourself, should I say, or to, to better yourself if you're going to carry on with God's word. All being said, it all sounds very encouraging. It's also quite knowledgeable. You know, that sounds all right. It's leadership bit. But scripture also makes it evident that being a leader, you're called to a higher standard of accountability. And it took me ages to find this because I knew it, I'd read it, I'd seen it. And it's in James chapter three, verse one, taming the tongue. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. So that's just like a, a word of caution on this. It, it was not easy. I know how much time Ruth sacrificed in preparing. Sacrifices at my mother. Good We haven't just knocked this out in five minutes before we got here. You know, it's taking time. It's taking it's taking a bit of time to research all those sort of things because we don't want to come before you and give you something that's not right or something that's not true 
So you have got a responsibility. You are accountable. And in scripture it says you know, you're more accountable because you're doing this sort of thing, because you're going to be teaching people. So, so please bear that in mind. All right. On that cheery note, I'm going to encourage everyone to be leaders for about 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. 20 seconds, <laughs> discouraging them all from being leaders. But I'm going to hand it over to Bob now, he's going to be a bit more cheerful and a bit more positive. He's going to, he's going to talk to us about leading like Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Dave. So, uh, having listened to what Dave just said about leadership in that role, <coughs> it made me think, go back a long time, to, to be a very young Christian. And, and I wanted to. I wanted to. I wanted my life to please the Lord. I, early in my Christian life, I learned I wanted my life to please the Lord. But the, the the thing was, is when I came to that point, I said, Lord, I want to please you in my life. I gave him a big list of things that I didn't want to do. I won't do this. Uh, I'm not. I'm not a leader. Uh, I'm not. Uh, uh, I'm not. Uh, pastor of a church, I'm not a Bible teacher, I'm not this, I'm, and I had this big list of stuff that I said to God, I want to serve you God, but none of that. <laughs> and, and so all of the things, it, it fits together really well, because all of the things that Dave was saying were the things that put me off. Because I, 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 I can't, I, I, no, none of that, none of that for me, thank you very much. Um, but you know, all I could say is, is be careful what you tell God you don't want to do. <laughs> because God has a, well, he gave us a sense of humor, doesn't he? And I can tend to think he's got a sense of humor. So he said, oh, you don't want to do this, do you not? And one of the things I used to I say is, uh, I don't want to sing. You know, I don't mind singing there, but I'm not going to lead singing. I like playing guitar, but that. And, and he, he threw a whole lot on his head, the whole lot of it on his head. And I finished up doing every single one of the things that I told him I wanted to do. <laughs> Right, so, but, but you see, and I'm not, I'm not putting myself on the back here, all I'm trying to do is I'm trying to give you my personal experience, my testimony. And, and, and when, when Samuel was sent by God to anoint a new king of Israel, and all these sons of, these sons of Africa, David. Eh? David. But he was sons of Jesse, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And all his sons came before him, and Samuel's there saying, it's him. God said, no, it's not him. Oh, it's him, because he looks the part. No, no. No, it's him. No, no. He's, oh, surely it's him. No. Well, who is it then? And, the, and some almost insignificant shepherd boy out in the field. Oh, you, oh yeah. And, and he said, because God doesn't look on the outward appearance, he looks on the heart. So when he's looking for leaders, he's looking at your heart. Okay? So all of the things that Dave's saying there are the right things for God to do, to use you as a leader. But what, what, I, what I'm saying is that all of those things start to come into play once you realise that God's call is on your life to become one of those leaders. And, and, then, and then, the, then the principles and the styles and everything start, start to become um, relevant to it. But, but it also, uh, again, I, I spoke a few weeks ago about John. John was an unschooled man. He was a fisherman. He, he was just another day. This might be your just another day. Uh, and and it, and, and it, you, you just normal, um, you know, a theological person. You, you know, you're not trained in any kind of, of nothing, nothing at all. You just you just this fisherman, who's, you know, and, and God comes along and says, I, I want you, I want you to follow me. And 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 that is the amazing thing. And, and, and then all the, all the, the learning starts. The things that they're going through there are the learning. How God will, because Ruth said something in the week, but she, she said she didn't claim to have said it, uh, written it. But he says it's that, that God doesn't call the equipped, He equips the called. Mm-hmm. And so if you're called, and all the, all the attributes that Dave's bringing into that there about the leadership side of everything starts to work because God starts to put those that lead the teaching and the learning and the understanding into your life to enable you to, to achieve what he's calling you to do. So don't worry, you know, if, if, 
you know, if, if I'm not of any strong theological, you know, understanding and, and, and that, well, don't rule yourself out. Don't, you know, you're here today, and we're all here today, don't rule yourself out of anything. Because if your heart's for the Lord, you never know. You never know what God might just say to you, even today. So anyway, my, my uh, you know, there's the verses in Timothy. Paul was writing to Timothy. Paul was pastoring Timothy. And, he, and the pastorals that he wrote. And, and, he, and one thing he said to Timothy, he said, fan into flame the gift of God that is within you from his laying on his hands. And I, I don't know whether we, we could do this today, or whether, whether we get time, I don't know. But, but lay hands on, 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 on each other, or maybe we'll do it. I don't know. But, you know, we're here today, you know, and just maybe, just maybe, God's got some, some serious future leaders here today. You know, who, who, could, who could really, really achieve what his will and purposes are. Yeah. So anyway, my, my quick things. I've got a few things to, to take from Jesus because it's leading like Jesus. Okay? So I, I'll add on to some of the things that Dave was saying about, about leadership. Um, so, and, and he's, he's pinched a few of my eyes anyway, but I'm sorry. Because we didn't <laughs> share. Uh, all we did is we just, put, we just put the basics down of what we're going to say. So, you know, if anything overlaps, then it's just confirmation, isn't it? Okay, so what, one, of the, <coughs> one of the first things that Jesus did in his leadership, you know, I mean, you could, you could, you might say you could spend hours on this, but I've got to set some pinpoints here. One of the first things that Jesus did in his leadership, which is what Dave mentioned, is, is he chose those people who would continue the work after he'd gone. And he was handing the baton on. So, so the baton needs to be on. Let, let, let's understand something here. All of us are here today because somebody handed a baton on to someone else, and they they did they carried the baton and did the work. That work reached us, and it, and it's brought us into God's kingdom. And and then, and, and then so it is our duty now and that to, to carry the baton and hand it to somebody else who will then carry on and do their lap with the baton, and they'll do that and then they'll hand it on to someone else. So the first thing that Jesus did in his leadership is was to pre is to prepare his disciples. To become leaders, and I liked it because, and again, he's mentioned it. He's mentioned it. Is is that he didn't look for the for the religious people and the Pharisees and all that who were the trained religious. He looked for those people who had a heart to follow him, and he saw past everything else and saw the hearts of those people. And I, I mean, I spoke about John, but I have heard people speak about every single one of the 12 disciples who was chosen by Jesus were really not the right person in the world's eyes, in the society's eyes. In, 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 oh, you're going to choose him? What, what are you choosing him? No, choose, choose, choose that person. He's, he's, a, he's, a, he's trained in that, so he's surely got to be, well actually that might be the biggest obstacle, so that he wanted people with his heart. And that, so he chose these people, and it was crucial that, that those people he chose would continue the work after he's after he's left, and that and and it, and it did and it worked. And do you know what? It was the power of the Holy Spirit that came upon them. Uh, and, and in, in Acts chapter four, uh, well, I'll put you, they were not the obvious choices. You know, the people who he chose were not the obvious choices. Okay, but but just as a result of what Jesus chose in Acts chapter four, it says when they saw the courage of Peter and John, they realised they were they were unschooled, ordinary people. And they were astonished, but they took, took note that they'd been with Jesus. So that's the first thing. Don't count yourself out. The second thing, a leader, and these are all taken from Jesus himself. A leader, in God's work, needs to be full of the Holy Spirit. He needs to be full of the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus himself was full of the Holy Spirit. And he says... Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River, and he was led by the Spirit to the wilderness. You need to be full of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. He returned being full of the Holy Spirit. When he passed the baton on to his disciples, they were full of the Holy Spirit's power. The difference was, is that, is that before the Holy Spirit, they were denying, with the Holy Spirit, they stood in front of thousands mm -hmm. and preached the gospel with signs and wonders following and, and Ruth has said to mention this morning is that people came into the kingdom people were coming into the kingdom of God the difference was this is that the religious leaders of the day had, had gone into religiosity 
and the life had gone out of it. But Jesus brought life back into his message, and it was the Holy Spirit that brought the life. Okay, a leader needs to know the Bible. When the devil tempted Jesus, the devil quoted scripture mm-hmm. at Jesus. Mm-hmm. And I, 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 again, through, through the years of listening to different people preach, you pick up things that stay with you forever. And somebody said to me, uh, in, in a preach, not to me, they were saying in a preach, he, he said that whenever the devil quotes the Bible, he misquotes the Bible. <coughs> misquotes it. And there's a lot of people who can misquote the Bible, aren't there? And, and we, we live in a, in, a, in a world of... It's always been misquoted. They will take what it says and twist around. But you know what it says? The Holy Spirit will lead you into truth. It will give you the true understanding of what the Word of God says. And so we need to know what the Bible says. So when the devil tempted Jesus about uh, about um, what, what one of the... Uh, the turning into the, into the bread and that and then Jesus, uh, Jesus uh, said the Bible also says yeah, mm-hmm. it is written. Mm-hmm. yeah. so he, he said you must not test the Lord, Lord your God and we need to know what the scriptures say we need to know what it, what it is and so if you're going to be a, if you're a leader a leading like Jesus Jesus knew the scriptures and he, and he wouldn't let the devil twist them round into saying something that they didn't really say. And that so <coughs> Jesus knew how to, and there's a good word in the New Testament in, in it later, I think it's Timothy again, it's in, who knows how to rightly divide the word of truth. So you need to know the word of truth. So you know what happens? That's through studying the word of God. And as you're studying it, as you're reading it, ask the Spirit to reveal things to you. And that's what I meant this morning when I said, about, about t- each one of us in here and uh, everywhere have got the potential <coughs> to teach something. You know, what does teach mean? It means that you bring to someone's attention something that they didn't know. That's right. Isn't it? They didn't know that before. So you've taught them something. And if you've read something in the Word of God and it, and it, and it goes, wow, it ins- inside you, it, it comes into, that is amazing. That is amazing. I've got to share that with somebody. And you might share it in church one day and everybody will go, wow. Uh, um, Glenn Barrett introduced somebody at the, the conference of the week and he said, he introduced this guy who was to preach. He said, this guy has got the ability to bring out something that you may have read 50 times and never seen. And never seen. And when he reads it, he expounds on that and you go, I have never seen that <coughs> in that verse before. And that, and that, so you might have that experience. So we, we could all be teachers because you can all bring something to our attention, something that we didn't know through the word of God. So Jesus knew the Bible. So from Jesus, uh, perspective of leadership know the Bible okay another thing that I heard recently uh, is <coughs> that if you want to be, if you want to be anointed and you work for the Lord you've got to pray some things there are substitutes for and some things there are not and prayer there is no substitute for prayer none it's the only thing that will draw you closer to the Lord it's, and it's your personal time of praying with the Lord. And it, I just look quickly looked up, and, it, and it's recorded that Jesus, it's recorded, I'm sure John said, if everything Jesus did was written, there'd be too many books to, to, to write it all down. But, but in the books that we've got, it's recorded that Jesus went out and prayed nine times. And if Jesus needed to go out, he's a son of God. And he, one day, after Jesus went up onto a mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night. Jesus went and prayed <coughs> to God all night. Now, I, I've got to say this, that, that if Jesus went to pray all night, and he was the Son of God, what inspiration can we gain from that? How much do I need to go and pray? And that, and, and there's a difference between a, a fleeting, quick, hi God, uh, I thank you for this, uh, uh, on your way. There's a difference. If you, if you, I remember speaking to a men's meeting years ago, and, and, and I was speaking about prayer, and I said, look, just, just find that, that quiet place and go and pray. Why don't you do it? Just do it. Be disciplined. Do it for two weeks and see what happens. Do it. Just try and if, and if you've done it and you spend 15 minutes or something or you spend 20 minutes and just say, well, I'm just going to shut everything out 
you know, turn the phone off or whatever, get yourself into a place where you can just quietly let everything fade into the background, you know, spend that, that time with the Lord and do it for two weeks and see what happens. And I'll tell you this, honestly, if nothing happens, well, don't do it anymore then. <laughs> but if something happens, why don't you carry on and just see what God might do? Because if Jesus went out to pray, I can say that from his example, I need to know, there's no substitute for prayer. Prayer brings anointing. Oh, just before you carry on, I found a very interesting thing that I stuck on the board. It says, is prayer your steering wheel or spare tire? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Is your steering wheel or spare tire? I, I, was, I was talking to Jackie just before, before, before the meeting there. And I tell you, there's one thing that the devil cannot stand is you praying. He cannot stand it. Because you enter into, into a spiritual domain whereby the devil has no authority. He has no access. He's no inroads to it. He's, he's no defense against it. He has nothing to come back against the power of your prayers because your prayer is bringing the power of God into your earthly life and situation over which the devil has no control. He likes to control that, you know, and I can't really explain how it all works, except that I know this, that, and, and Dave will bear me out on this, is as soon as you want to make a step forward for the things of God in your life, and the same with Jackie, as soon as you want to do that, the devil raises his game against you and wants you to stop it, and wants you to fail, and wants you to give up, quit. But I say this, prayer, prayer overpowers the work of the enemy and stops his plans Having, having the last say. Whoa, right, okay. <laughs> a leader. A leader must be humble. Must be humble. I think we're touching that, were you? About that, I read this morning about a servant. Yeah, you really didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Just it well, yeah, but say yes, great. A leader must be humble. <laughs> Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority okay, over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. So yeah, having known that, he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, poured water into the basin, and then he began to wash the disciples' feet. Mm. Drying them with a towel. That's about as low as you could get. I, I don't know. You might not. But in, in those days, if you if you washed the feet of somebody, mm. it showed your 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 servanthood. And he began to wash the disciples' feet, mm. drying them with a towel way around him. And when Jesus came to Simon Peter, Simon said to him, Peter said to him, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. Mm. You know, you 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 you're you're, the, you're 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 my Lord. You know, you 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 can't do that. I don't want you to do that. But Jesus said, you don't understand what I'm doing. He said, someday you will. No, I don't want Peter to possess him. You will never wash my... I love it when literalism meets spiritual... spiritual I don't want to say spiritual. But, but when literal things meet the spiritual things. Because a literal thing was he was doing a servant job. But spiritually, he, he, he was trying... And Peter couldn't grasp the spiritual side of what Jesus was doing. He kept looking at it as the human literal side. <coughs> but Jesus said, no... He said, he said, you don't understand what I'm doing now. And Peter said, no, you don't. I don't, I don't, you're not doing it. You'll never wash my feet. And Jesus said, well, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. So said, Peter said, well, don't just wash my hands. Wash me head, wash, wash me all over. <laughs> and again, he was so literal, Peter, when he went, oh, just wash me all over. Because, because, because then he started to understand. And after washing their feet, put his robe and said, sat down and, and asked, do you understand what I'm doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord, and your teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. And I give you an example to follow. Do as I have done, I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. And I just, just as a thought into that is, you know, whatever you attain to here in this world stays here in this world. Whatever you attain to in the kingdom of God lasts forever. Uh, just got one last.
last last one. In, in the example of Jesus, in the day space, this one as well, this time. Right. Makes you have time for people. Have you ever talked to somebody and all the time you're trying to walk off? And because it's like, you know, and they've no time to listen to you. And and you want you want you want them to share what, what, what maybe you're experiencing or or or, and, uh, or, or maybe you feel like that, that you are a little bit less than them and a little bit higher up the pecking order to you, so therefore they don't need to have the time. Make sure you have time for people. Because as Dave said, one day some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could touch and bless them. But the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. You know what, it's not going to the last page, it doesn't matter. Because we know what he says, don't it? He, he said, he said to the disciples, said, look, look, don't bother Jesus, he's, he's, he's busy, he's a busy man. You know, and he said, no, no. He said, I'm not King James, so I suffer little children to come unto me. So you know, on who's like this child that comes. And, and the way, I mean, you could, I, I'll stop there because the time's gone, but the way that Jesus demonstrated his leadership was an example for us all to follow. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I, I'm just so blessed that you can read through some of the things that you're there. It, you, can, you, know, you can read them. You can read them as an account of what Jesus did. Mm -hmm. And you can read them as something that you can say, Lord, can I have some more of that in my heart and in my life? And just show me and teach me so that after I've got past all my list of things that I never want to do, and, and there are all the reasons why I'm not qualified to do this, and all, all the, the reasons why there's somebody else who's better than me who could do this. But then, when you've done all of that, and you say, but Lord, you have my heart. Mm. And then that's the person that God wants to use. And then the teaching process starts. And you might not get it when he first says it like they were. Oh, I don't understand that, you know. And he, he talked about the Easter of the Pharisees, and he said, oh, talking about food again. And, you, and you, sometimes you do when you start to get understand things from a from the human point of view, but when it starts to come into a spiritual point of view, you start to go, wow, I can see that. Mm -hmm. I start to see that. And then the, the leadership showing and, and training and helping helps then for you to take those great points, deliver to people what God wants to get said into their lives, and then transformation starts taking place. And then you've fulfilled what God saw in you to be done in your life and in your work and in your calling. Amen. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've been quickly on to the last bit because we've lost the question, I've got a really good thank you. So, but because I've put it out some notes, <laughs> <laughs> it saves me writing. <laughs> <laughs> it's next, it? Cool. So, really good so far. So, talked about different styles of leadership, how Jesus led, really good, some really good things. Now I've got to, I've got to confess that what I've taken really is, is really the principles of some of the ministry and training um, that uh, we've been doing over the last sort of 12 months. Because what this started with was if you want to be an effective leader, you have to lead yourself well. So you have to lead yourself first. So to do all the things that Dave's talked about, all the things that Bob's talked about, is it comes back to you have to lead yourself first. Um, and you know, there's, there's a scripture in Luke chapter 2, uh, I think it's verse 52, it says where Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, and in favour uh, with people and with God. Um, so, to, you know, so for him to grow in stature, um, you know, what, uh, what I put here is you have to be rooted. So, you know, if you want to be a, a good oak tree, and you know, I like, I like to talk about trees a lot, um, you have to be rooted. <coughs> and then, you know, to grow in wisdom, you have to seek wisdom. So those are, I've just pulled out a couple of points, so we can rattle through these quite quite quickly. Um, you know, so I've defined leadership. Now, this guy, that the small print at the top, John Maxwell, um, now he is um, a prolific writer on leadership in the secular world, and praise God, he's a Christian too. So um, he writes a lot of, you know, from a very biblical perspective on leadership. And he writes that leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. It's influence, which I think we've already talked about. And I, and I read this somewhere, I can't confess to this. What, if you, you're not a leader if you don't have any followers. Um, so, you know, if you, if you, 
you have to be, but Dave's already talked about, you know, we're, we are all leaders, we've all got followers, even if they're just our children. Um, you know, we all have an influence. So basically, you're all a leader whether you like it or not, aren't you? Mm -hmm. um, so leading yourself well. So Jesus led himself, like, you know, Bob's talked about this. So this is where all leadership starts. Um, Self-leadership precedes team leadership and public influence. If you can't lead yourself well and you can't do that, then you shouldn't lead others. So, you know, this is why Jesus withdrew, like Bob already said, he withdrew to pray. That time is so important. You know, to lead well, you have to have that time where you go to the quiet place and, and spend that time with God. I've also thought he battled the devil to prove his character. Um, and he knew that his character, his identity, which is what we seek when we uh, spend this time with God, was the foundation of his ministry. And that's the same for us. We have to be absolutely certain and know our identity in Christ if we want to lead others in that path. So you only do that by spending that time and getting rooted. Um, we've got, I've printed all these verses here about, you know, what it means to be rooted. Because believe it or not, the Bible talks about it a lot. Okay, so I don't have to read all those out, but certainly the first one, you know, being rooted and established in love, um, how, uh, um, you know, to, to understand how wide and how long deep of love of Christ is. Yeah. Amazing. You know, planted by a river, all these verses that talk about how important it is to have your roots going down. Where are your roots going? Um, you know, because life happens, doesn't it? You know, we, life isn't a bed of roses. Whether you're a Christian or not, life happens. We all have to do it. Loss, bereavement. You know, bad things happen to us. Um, you know, and seed, but a seed doesn't choose the soil that it's planted in. We, we are, this is where we're planted here. It doesn't, we don't, we've not necessarily chosen this. Um, and we don't get to choose often many circumstances that happen to us. Um, and sometimes it's the consequences of our own actions where we suffer, um, you know, because of what we've, we've made those, those choices. Um, so, as people, what we experience difficulties we don't often know how to deal with. Uh, maybe don't have anybody to talk to. And um, we blame ourselves, and before we know it, we're in a bad place. And if we are drawing them, um, if our roots are going down into the bad place, what we are going to produce is not going to be good. It might be disappointment, it might be unforgiveness, it might be bitterness, shame, or low self-worth. So you, this is why it's so important, you need to make sure you are planted, your roots are going down into the Word of God. Um, and we can be held captive by our thoughts, can't we? Um, I've thought, I know I've spoken about this before, because thoughts can be so inhibiting and so immobilizing um, and often we find ourselves making decisions that do not have the best outcome thoughts can be destructive thoughts can be untruthful they don't tell us the truth they can be lies <coughs> you know and god doesn't want us down there this is really important god doesn't want us down there he wants us up there he doesn't want us down there he wants us up there um, so how we process our thoughts is vital to moving forward in a godly and healthy way and if you read Psalms, you know, David talks to himself. I don't know if you've noticed that, but when you read a Psalm and David says, you know, like, I'm in such a bad place right now, um, but I'm still going to praise God, um, and then I'm going to tell everybody else to praise God too. You know, God, David is talking, he's recognising that he's not always in a good place, but he, he speaks over that place. Um, I, he confesses that place, so he's not denying it. He's not saying, oh, well, you know, I, I love God and everything's rosy. David experienced some really tough times. You read the Psalms and you, read, you think, you know, he acknowledges where he's at, he acknowledges what God can do, and then he also then tells other people what God can do as well. A good way of, of dealing with that. But 2 Corinthians, you know, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine powers uh, to demolish mm -hmm. strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself against the knowledge of God, and we take every captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. So you know when you're in that place um, where you might be having a really tough time with your thinking, um, you know, what you really need to do is draw nourishment from God. You need to know the truth. 
and this is where that importance of spending time and seeking God uh, goes to. Knowing his word is essential uh, to leading ourselves out of that unhealthy way of thinking to a godly way of thinking that brings light, truth and freedom into our lives. So I think I've wrote this in the notes. If you find yourself overtaken by thoughts that are not doing any good, capture this thought and acknowledge it before God. I'm worried about this thought. This is really bothering me. I'm going to present this to you, God, just like David does. What, does, what then do you think, what does the Bible say about this thought? Is this thought true in light of what God's promises are for me? You know, take it and examine it in the light. And then, you know, and then you've got the truth then over your thought, haven't you? You might also think, what would the person who loves me the most tell me about how I'm thinking? You know, he thinks, they'd say, that's a lot of rubbish. You know, you, you're this, I'm, I'm having a really bad day, I'm not good at this, I'm no good at that. And, but the person who loves you would say, actually, you are so precious and so valuable to me. There must be a more kinder and more compassionate way to view. And then to also reflect back on what we have to survive and cope with and what is is good. So adding to the evidence that this thought that we're thinking that's doing us harm is actually a lot of rubbish. Okay. So a challenge then to think about your thinking, notice the effect that it's had on your mental, physical and spiritual health. I thought I know I'm rushing, I'm really sorry. Um, engage in the active process of identifying faulty thoughts or beliefs and putting them through the filter of God's word. And asking for forgiveness, you might need to ask for forgiveness if you if you need to ask for forgiveness. You know, God is such a gracious God, He's so full of mercy and grace. You go before God and say, I've had this thought, I know it's not in line with your word, Lord, I just want to ask for forgiveness because this is what you're telling me, that this is not my identity in you. I am saved, I am redeemed, I am forgiven, I am, I am a new person in Christ. So important. Um, <clears throat> so engage with that process putting it through the filter. Um, and then, this is so good, sit in that truth then. Go to your devotional time. Sit in that truth. You know, that's when it needs to take some time. You know, if you're rushing, which I am a lot, um, you know, you just need to actually stop and really speak truth. And that takes time. It takes that devotional time to really sit in that moment of truth. Um, because, because, you know, I, I spoke a few weeks ago about changing your way you think. That takes time as well. When you're carving out a new way of thinking, that takes time. Because your habit will take you one down one path because that's the easiest route when you're in a rush. Um, but when you take that time to carve out a new way of thinking, um, to sit in that time and, and speak the truth of God's word over a thought that is not doing you any good, that's the way you change your think. That's the way you change how you think. Um, and trust one another, indulge in, um, sorry, engage, not indulge, engage in vulnerable and authentic relationships. Get support, get alongside one another. Tell somebody you trust in and pray with them as you go through this process. So that is <coughs> being, the importance of being rooted. Did you all get that? I'm speaking really fast. <laughs> so, next bit. I'll take one of them. I know, we you got to say, oh, will you? Yeah. Seeking wisdom, what is wisdom? Earthly wisdom, so we're going back to the definition. The wisdom is the ability to make good judgments based on what you've learned from your experience or the knowledge and understanding of what gives you this ability. But divine wisdom is the divine influence upon one's heart and thoughts. The evidence is seen in the discerning mind. The wisdom of God is revelationary, revelatory, and provides a person with insight and understanding into personal, general, and complex situations. It is knowledge which teaches and instructs and knowledge which is life giving. So <clears throat> I put some verses there about the definitions of wisdom, uh, which you can have a read of. Um, I love Proverbs 3, uh, the very last one there, where it talks about, you know, um, wear net wisdom around your neck like a necklace, you know, like an ornament, like a, something there that is, is, is visible, that you can touch, that other people can see. It's a reminder that you have the wisdom of God at your, um, to access to any God. But it's God that gives divine wisdom. And again, that comes back to seeking godly knowledge, spending time in God's word, which, which um, Bob so spoke about. Um, it is God who gives divine wisdom, and godly knowledge that teaches and instructs, and this is then recognised in the visible outworking of the indwelling presence of the Spirit. 
So, coming back to spending time with God. Okay. So, to lead with wisdom, we acknowledge that we have a responsibility. So, to grow in wisdom requires personal responsibility. Um, you know, we're reminded of, of that scripture where Jesus takes himself back to Elisa's parents and he takes himself back to the temple because he wants to grow in knowledge, he wants to engage in teaching, he wants to engage in conversations. And this is Jesus growing in wisdom. Um, it requires humility, we've already talked about humility as well, um, to recognise our own limitations, I need to listen and to engage with others that are more experienced. Again, it comes back to being part of our body, of the church, you know, in our journey of discipleship, we must strive to remain teachable, um, and that takes a level of self-awareness and understanding of our blind spots. Um, on multiple okay, oh, that was good. This, is, this is good. We need to listen, and listen well. Do you have ears to listen, or ears to hear? On multiple occasions, Jesus called his disciples to hear what he is saying through his parables and saying, and this remains with us today. If any of you lack wisdom, ask God who gives generous words. Brilliant scripture. Mm-hmm. And we know that the wisdom that comes, we know it's not our wisdom, because it says it's both, it's, it's pure, it's peaceful, it's considerate, submissive, full of mercy, good fruit, impartial, and sincere. A lot of it that comes against our human nature. So we know that when we are behaving and acting in a certain way, that is God's wisdom. Wisdom also requires reflection. Um, to help cultivate that habit of intentional, serious thoughts. How often do we stop and think and uh, ponder to, um, to have that prayerful appro- approach on what God wants to say to us. Um, reflection gives you the space to ask questions. Uh, become a reflective learner. Um, you know, and he says that, that scripture there, we've not stopped giving thanks to you. And, you know, that's where we get revelation. When we stop and pray and ask God for that, that wisdom and revelation. And last of this section, resilience. So the capacity, that means the capacity to withstand or to recover quickly from difficulties. So growing and leading with wisdom requires <coughs> perseverance and determination. Um, if you're going to continue to grow in wisdom, despite adversity, it depends on how we look at it. Arguably, you could view how adversity becomes a vehicle for our growth and increased wisdom. We don't think that when we are going through a difficult time, do we? We don't think, oh gosh, this is, this is, oh, what a great thing this is, I'm on a vehicle of, 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 of learning. <laughs> you just want it all to go away. But you know what? When we press into God and we take, we've gone back to taking um, captive our thoughts and, and thinking, my right, God, how do you want me to deal with this? This is how we grow in wisdom and resilience. Um, so yes, that last that last bit of the verse there, therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. It takes practice. Um, you know, I've also just read a book called Practicing the Way because Jesus was, you know, his his movement was often described as, as the way, <clears throat> and we put it into practice. We're not expecting everybody to have the knowledge and skills immediately. It takes practice. We grow. We grow in all the time. And then the last little bit was about was just about relationships. You know, we both talked about how Jesus had disciples. We have. We need to have relationships with one another to encourage one another, to um, share with one another a trusted relationship. A good circle of friends who hold us to account, but also speak truth into our lives. We model intimacy with Jesus. Mm-hmm. And that's it. Well, I'm sorry that was a bit of a rush, because we're a bit out of time. But, um, but yeah, start with leading yourself. Mm-hmm. Okay. While you were talking, just the thought came to me on that building the fourth building the wise man built his house on the rock mm-hmm. yeah. to build a house you've got to take planning yeah. material and then put it together yeah. so it takes time mm-hmm. it doesn't just happen happen yeah. because if it did it would fall over well that's right mm-hmm. yeah.